I started a, a charity in India called Wildlife SOS uh, with my co-founder and colleague Geeta Seshamani um, in 1995. It's also a, a charity in the States here now. Uh, with the help of some volunteers, we managed to get that happen. So that's kind of the distance we traveled to get here to speak with all of you today. Now, what got me to, to do this was the fact that as a, as a young boy, I, I spent a lot of time in the, in the forests, in the jungles in India, and tigers were something that, that uh, the jungles were home to. Very often you would hear the calls of a, of a tiger reverberating through the, through the forest. It would go something like this. Oh, oh, oh. And it kind of goes through you. Like, a, like an electric current and just makes you respect nature. That, that's what I grew up to uh, a lot through school and college. Magnificent animals like the leopards that you see every day, the unique sloth bear, not as unique as the drug dealing stuff that uh, we had an earlier speak, speaking about, um, and uh, the scaly anteater or the pangolin. Now, these animals were getting really rare and um, what bothered me was that these animals were disappearing. And it, it really got to me back then when I was, was, when I was in school. We, um, we started noticing a lot of animals being captured and then we had to rescue. For example, this horned owl was rescued um, from some poachers who were selling it to someone where this owl would be an ingredient in, in a black magic ritual. Um, so this is, uh, this is what was going on back then. And ba baby bear cubs, again, bear paw soup is a delicacy in some parts of the world. And these are bear cubs that we had to rescue. As this poaching and, and uh, mass killing of these wild animals went on, it really bothered me a great extent. Nothing was spared, even uh, cobras uh, deadly cobras, as deadly as they could be, were captured. Their uh, venom glands gouged out, their fangs plucked out through pliers, and uh, their mouths stitched up sometimes. They would be used for street performances, um, as snake charmers would use them. And when they were too weak to be used, they would be skinned alive and turned into purses or wallets or handbags. That's what a dead cobra looks like. That, that in fact, is two dead cobras. So no animal was, is safe. Uh, tigers, leopards, hyenas, uh, otters, every single animal was being uh, poached. Body parts used uh, in every way possible. These are leopard and tiger claws that are being used as good luck charms uh, across India in, in many places. Bear teeth. And claws, in many cases, these teeth are actually pulled out of these bears when they're still alive and sold off as good luck charms and amulets. Bear parts, as you can see over here, um, taught me the, the, their ingredients in traditional Chinese medicine. This, this kind of taught me that um, enforcing the law wasn't really going to help. We had to do more than that. And it led me to try and dig deeper and understand the business of poaching. What was this? business of poaching. It's uh, an extremely dirty business. It's only second next to narcotics on the world crime scale. And the fact that India had um, porous borders across the, um, on, its, on its borders didn't help. Um, we had wildlife traders using extremely creative and uh, clever methods of getting wildlife contraband out of our country by hiding contraband in bags of salt, and sacks of coal and putting them on donkey backs, on the backs of donkeys and, and taking them across borders. So um, who were these people? Why were they poaching these animals and, and uh, where did they live? Now, this led me to understand the hunting communities in India. This is a hunting community called the Bavariyas. Um, this is a Bavaria camp and they specialize in hunting leopards and tigers and killing them only, largely. And uh, children in their camp are desensitized when they're really young. They start by killing birds and small animals. And this child is barely three years old, already has a knife in his hand. This is another community called the Badiyas. They have no literacy at all, 
No health care, no education in these families. Uh, a snake charmer from a jogi community. So there were tons of these communities that we wanted to work with, we had to work with and understand. Now these communities believed in their elders. The elders in the community like this man are the ones who enforce the law. They had their own laws. They didn't uh, follow the law of the land and they didn't care about jail so much. It didn't, it didn't make a big deal to them. The tools they use are so simple, but ex when combined with their uh, excellent field skills, these uh, tools are deadly. Now this is probably something most of you may not have seen. This is a, a jaw trap um, or a leg hole trap as we call it. It's made with discarded car parts, a rusted chain, a bit of sack and a piece of wood which works as an anchor and that costs less than five dollars to make and will trap a tiger in the wild. Once a tiger is trapped, it's not easy for it to get out. If it does, then it's disabled for life. If it doesn't, then it's bludgeoned and beaten to death so the skin doesn't get damaged and then the skin is removed and sold off along with the bones and the fat which become ingredient, ingredients in Chinese traditional medicine and uh, sent off to various countries, Southeast Asia, um, through traders. So what this, this taught us was that uh, if we did not do something about helping these communities, because these communities have been doing this for centuries, for decades, and uh, going to jail was not a big deal. They were going to jail, come back out on bail, and go back straight to killing. And we need to, needed to do something which was compact, which was sensible, which was uh, sustainable in the, in the long run. And alternative livelihoods, rehabilitation, uh, which would provide them um, another way of, of changing their lives, create employment opportunities, and this is what we did. We tried to get seed funds through Wildlife SOS, uh, provide them alternative livelihoods, and in this case, we started harnessing the excellent skill they had with handling wild animals. This is not a a deer on the ground being killed or hunted. It's actually a, a Nilgai antelope that's been rescued by a team and every one of those six people you see there is a reformed hunter that we ended up recruiting and training. This Nilgai antelope is being uh, rehabilitated and moved from the Delhi airport where it get, got onto the runway and we released it alive and safe. This is a, a hyena that was injured and, and is being moved to the to the Wildlife SOS Hospital. We had to train these people in uh, care and compassion and handling animals properly, but it was well worth it. It made a huge impact. This monkey was electrocuted, and this reformed hunter is rescuing this monkey, not killing it, and brought it to a hospital that survived. So Wildlife SOS actually runs a 24-7 hotline using reformed poachers and hunters to rescue animals, and it, and it started working. This is a challenging one, uh, this leopard was trying to cross into a farmhouse, got impaled on a wall top fence. There was an electric line right next to it and our team showed a lot of hardiness and courage in rescuing this leopard. But not everything goes as well. In some cases, we have been very fortunate to convert these um, reformed hunters into intelligence gathering people. So they go hang out with the bad guys, smoke some marijuana, gather intelligence, <laughs> pass it on back to us. And we use that intelligence to arrest poachers like this. Uh, these are two poachers who've been arrested red-handed with a leopard skin. And we've had several successful operations across India. It's, it's worked incredibly well, using the community to infiltrate other poaching communities and, and learn more about it. This lady had been selling backups for decades. Um, again, it was our intelligence network developed entirely from reformed poachers that helped us do this. We rescued this backup. He was barely two weeks old and he made it eventually. It's, it's really sad sometimes when we have to do these uh, rescues and you find these orphan cubs and the mothers have been killed. Uh, crime occurs in very remote parts in India and uh, anti-poaching operations create positive moments and motivation for our enforcement agencies and the police. You know, not often do they get to smile uh, considering the amount of crime and, and uh, gory stuff that they have to deal with. So this is quite a rare photo. Now these children are from these hunting communities. They um, have never been educated, they need education, otherwise they're gonna go the same way as their parents have. This girl 
over here is going to school. We've been able to send her and 800 other children like her to school. Here's a photo of a, of a group of children getting books and just getting ready to go to school. And it's, it's now a proven method. If we can send, if just a few of us in a small organization like Wildlife SOS are able to make this change, if all of us get together, we can make this happen. It costs us about $15 a month to send a child to school, pay the school fees, uniforms, books, etc. And, and we can make that happen. We can make that change. So the first thing we had to do was take the word impossible and throw it out. Thank you very much. I'm going to end my talk with another call of how the, lep of how the tiger calls in India and in Indian jungles, how you hear that. Oh, oh, thank you.